In today's episode, we have Rockstar Pilates instructor Alice Scott join us. She talks about how to facilitate an empowering and welcoming experience for students of all varying degrees of Pilates experience in a large reformer setting. She also talks us through candidly her experience of pregnancy and returning to exercise and Pilates instructing postpartum. We know you'll get a lot out of this. Hi, Alice. Hi, Chloe. Welcome to Pilates Elephants. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. It, I feel like this has been um, a long time coming, maybe. I don't know. It's just, it feels to me strange that we haven't had you on the podcast yet. I'm very honoured to be here. For a second, I was like, why do they want to chat to me? And then I thought, mm, that imposter syndrome's creeping up again. But I'm very excited. And yeah, I think it's time. Now is a good time. The stars have aligned. Stars have aligned. So, um, Alice, tell us, for, for all our, our listeners, um, Awesome Pilates, shout out to all our listeners all around the world and all the uh, lovely feedback that you've all been sending in and keeping those, also while I'm at it, a little plug, please keep the five-star ratings coming <laughs> on the app. I've noticed that the ratings have like not getting as much feedback, so keep, keep that coming for us. So for all our listeners, Alice, tell us, who are you? Well, my name is Alice, if you didn't catch that. Alice, <laughs> Alice Scott. <laughs> Alice Scott, or you may know me as Alice Bebby Scott. And I teach Pilates here in Sydney, Australia. And I've been teaching Pilates for a, a good while now. I would say almost, I think almost 12 years. Wow. I've been, yeah, I've been in it for 12 years. And it's taken me to well, not many a country, but I've taught Pilates overseas. I taught in Dubai. I did a little stint in a boxing gym in Ireland. So I put that down. International. <laughs> I did not know that. How have I? I knew you taught in Dubai, but I didn't know you taught in Ireland. Well, it was just like a little class I did at Miguel's old boxing gym, and it was amazing. It was so good. I had people doing Pilates. Some of them were in the actual boxing ring. Then the, the rest were just scattered around the gym. Wonderful. And Miguel's your partner. Yes, yes. My Miguel is my partner and we have a little boy. He's now two and a half. My so I'm mum to a, a little wild child. He's full of energy. Oh my goodness. We need to bottle it and sell it because what he gets up to. Where do they get that energy from? It's full on, isn't it? I'm um, constantly blown away by the energizer bunnies that are my nieces and nephews. And it's just like, where is this coming from? And I'm sure all our <laughs> listeners who are uh, um, parents can totally <laughs> relate to this. Uh, oh. And it's really cool. We've actually now that the course is online, we've actually got so many little ones basically kind of around and, and joining joining in the course, um, which is really cool because, you know, you can study from home now, which is awesome. So, um Alice, today I'd really love to talk. I mean, I feel like we we haven't caught up for a long time, I and know. and we haven't, um, yeah. As I said, we haven't had you on on um, Pilates Elephants before, so I'd love to talk about kind of maybe sort of like the last couple of years. So you know the the transit. Like we'd really love to hear about what it was like coming back to teaching postpartum, love to hear about your your journey with that, um, maybe some of the challenges you might have faced there or, you know, just how, how it might have changed how maybe how you approach teaching or et cetera or how you approach working with postpartum clients. So I'd really yeah, love, I think our, our listeners would really benefit from that. Um, and I'd really love to to hear how that that journey's been for you, and also love you to share more about um, what you currently do uh, in the Pilates stratosphere with managing of um, Virgin Active. So I'll get you to sort of expand on that for our listeners, particularly for those overseas who might not um, know what that setting's like, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the ways that you go about managing large group classes. And when we say a large group class, we're talking 
25 plus reformers in a room. Yep. That's what we're, that's what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So ways to, Mm -hmm. to, how do we, how do we work with lots of clients uh, that might be at different stages or different things happening for them body wise and how you go about facilitating an awesome experience for everyone. So they're kind of the topics. Is there anything else you would, does that sound good to you? Do you know how much my brain is trying to remember all those things? Okay, okay. So that's okay. So that's enough. So we just go. We'll go step by step through those. So you're happy with that? We'll go step by. I'm very happy with that. Okay. Baby brain is still there, but I think a good place to start is, mm. you know, my current role. So what I do in the Pilates world is I'm the Pilates head coach of Virgin Active Australia, and it is my legit dream job. I love it. And I landed that job when I was six weeks pregnant. That's right. So one of the biggest break-offs in my career happened in the most profound time of my life. And it was full on. A lot of things were happening. There were a lot of moving parts. So that's kind of where I think the story kind of really begins. So I've been in this role for about three and a bit years now and it feels like it's gone so quick and I think anyone that has kids will know that time speeds up with a child, let alone without a child. And if you have fur babies, I'm sure it's the same. It's just like bang, months, weeks, days, it all rolls in. So I fell pregnant and uh, and I was actually doing some teacher training with Breathe Education unbeknownst to me, <laughs> I was with a child. So it was a point in my life where I'd been teaching for you know, quite a few years. I'd been contracting uh, in various studios, big and small. Some of these studios had five beds. Some of these studios had 17 beds. Some had like 20. And it was just kind of you rock and rolled and did the grounds. And that's all sort of I knew and I loved. And prior to that, you know, I'd done a quick stint in Dubai and the place that I was working at was still small-ish. It had maybe 10 reformer beds. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cruisy and comfortable. So that's and, so yeah. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna <laughs> point out there. So some of our listeners, 10 beds will sound a lot. So we've we've spoken with uh, many of our listeners in the US who, you know, a, a group reformer class might look more like a maximum of five beds. But 10 to you felt, and I mean, 10 to me as well would feel kind of smallish. We've definitely cut our, is it cutting your teeth? Is that like a, that's a saying, right? I always get my sayings wrong. We've cut, our, teeth. We've cut our teeth on large cut. Is that the wrong saying? Have I, anywho, we'll, we'll move along. But you and I, <laughs> we, we learned the trade in large group reform classes. I, we could both say that. Right. Okay. So you're in Dubai, there's 10 beds, which to you feels kind of small and kind of cruising, comfortable. Yeah. Um, But their, their mat class or their, their non-equipment class. So let's say their bar and the mat Pilates, that was big. We could, if we fit them in, they were coming in. Yeah. Right. So I, I kind of have always been able to teach in a way where I can be nimble in my approach of how do I bring it down? So in my experience teaching to five people I pull it down versus bringing it up to like 20 people and do you mean from a does that when you say you bring it down or bring it up do you mean from it like an energy output level that's actually a really good question because I would find the energy output level I felt sometimes would have to be bigger in a smaller group yeah I agree but I'm more talking from like a programming sense Ah, uh, so tell me, I'm still like. Am I making a brain more? tingle, Chloe? <laughs> You're making my brain tingle. Am I bending it? Mm, tell me more, Alice. Tell me more. What do you mean? I'm fascinated. Okay, we're dive, we're, we're like going straight in. We might have to backpedal. We might have to bit, backpedal, but, but I think you've said. Let's just get in it. What are you, yeah, we want to know. What do you mean? What do you mean? So, for example, if I have five people mm-hmm. and that to me is a small, intimate setting. Yep. And you may have, depending on where you're teaching, if it's associated with, say, an allied health professional or a physiotherapist or a chiropractor, you might have multi-level capabilities stepping in. You may have someone that's just got clearance to join a group exercise class. You might have someone that's, you know, postpartum. You might have someone that's, you know, just ready, raring to go. They love a good workout. 
So when I teach to that in a smaller setting, I, I feel like I'm ultra focused on it mm. and it, it's sort of like, okay, you're the happy there, you're happy there, you're happy there. And it's just really, you're juggling those balls and it's just, you're like, okay, it, it's happening, it's cool. And I feel when I'm teaching to that smaller smaller group, you kind of can't expand the layers as much as, say, a larger group because it's like they're ready and waiting. It's like let's rock and roll. So it's, it's a, for me I feel like I'm a little bit more zoomed in in right. a smaller class. Okay. And it, you kind of get into this vibe where you energetically you're, you're reading these people and you're like, are you, have, are you okay, you okay, you okay, you okay? And 45 minutes or an hour goes by and you think, okay, that was, that was hard. Take it to a larger group yeah. where you still have those same people. Yeah. You still have postpartum. You will still have people that are recovering from maybe a chronic issue or something that, something that they feel is a limitation. But in a larger class, and we may even break this down further, but you can set a layer and that's almost the experience. You can build an exercise up, say, from a foundational or a variation and then build it up to potentially the full expression of the repertoire but you almost take them on a little bit of that movement journey and it's almost like this finding your tribe vibe and everyone's kind of cruising together and some people may break off and stay with more of that modified version and still rock and roll it where others they're going to build up the layers and begin to progress and everyone's then kind of humming in this vibration of movement. So for me I find that's where my teaching style just absolutely sings. Like that's where, that's my happy place. So if I did have a preference, I think I'm more used to teaching to these larger groups where I, I program for success through layers where sometimes when you dial it back to say five people, you can still give a really amazing experience. But it, it just seems you, sometimes I get a little bit like almost too too invested or too concerned that it, it alters me. Mm. It starts to interfere with the flow. It starts mm. to interfere. I start, you know, is this okay? Self-doubt can start creeping in a little bit. That's really interesting. So the larger groups are your flow state. I, I mean, I'm the same. I've, you know, throughout my career, I've, I've definitely gravitated towards the larger group. And I remember even working at a studio um, in Melbourne and basically being given the option of doing some work in the, in the studio space, meaning the more clinical space, or spending the majority of my time in the large reformer space. And I was just like, oh, large reformer, put me in the large reformer space because totally that's, I, I couldn't agree more. That's where I get in into my flow state. And I love that, that energy that you're, you're speaking about that really comes with that, that group setting. Um, and that's not to say too, that many of our listeners might not be listening to this and going, Hey, no, I actually, I feel like I can create that in a smaller setting. Um, so it's not that it can't be created in a smaller setting. This is just POV, our point of view, personal experience, um, yeah. but more power to you if you, you're creating, you know, the flow in the, in the smaller setting too, both are, both are freaking awesome. So, okay, nice one. Thanks for, thanks for fleshing that out for us, Alice. So where are we? We are, where, where were we in the, in the story? You said, here's okay, a nice so place to start. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's pull it back. I know, right? Oh my goodness. We're just going to go on so many tangents. Like strapping everyone, you're on for a wild ride. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll rein us back in. I'll rein us back in. <laughs> so I think, you know, yes, those experiences definitely can be brought to life in a small or large and finding where you feel your strongest or your mo most confident. Sometimes you have to step into places where you don't always innately feel super confident. So if I feel comfortable in a large group setting, someone else may not. And that's something that we encounter. So with Virgin Active in Australia, our Reformer studios can hold anywhere from 18 to generally 25. And we have one studio where we're even contemplating going up a little bit higher. Wow. And it's, it's this real, um, it's kind of this, people get a little bit anxious, maybe a little unsure, uncertain. Can you teach good quality Pilates to that many people. 
So and one of my sorry, oh, Chloe. You oh go. no, I was going to say, are they the classes are categorized? Are they? Do you have or are they open level? Do you have beginners? Do you have like? Do you have a system whereby you filter people through so that so that someone who's never been on a reformer doesn't end up in the class that's you know full of you know twenty five plus people in their flow state and they're kind of like the fish out of water. Like how do you? How do we manage that? How do you manage that? How, how do you prepare for that? And that's one of the big things as a Pilates head coach, I look at, I help develop the programs. Right. You know, how do we create a reformer class that can cater to all these people? So in Australia, and I work closely with the global head of Pilates and yoga, Mark Cito. So we kind of put our heads together and we're like, how do we bring this to life? And how do we make everyone feel welcome? So we have three main programs that we have open to any member. And intro is designed to give people the basics, the the operations on how you adjust a foot bar, move the spring. And it is slightly slower paced purely because it's a little bit more interactive in the sense of this is what we're going to do and now let's feel it. Let's play with it, flesh Mm. it out. So it's an opportunity to do, say, chest expansion on a red spring, do that chest expansion sitting down, cross-legged on a box, playing with different spring tensions. So they build up the confidence and but not necessarily the absolute certainty. They kind of just get the bread and butter of it. Mm. Then we encourage them step into reforma, which is more open level. Right. So we definitely want people to come in, move through intro as many times as they like. There's no limit. We used to have limitations. We've taken that away. Oh, like you can only do intro once kind of thing? Not necessarily. So we we haven't put a magic number. There is no magic number that will determine someone's skill level. Yeah, that's really. And that's, pu- <laughs> that's purely like trial and error. So we used to say we um, recommend three to five. And right. recommend is a word that can get turned into almost a mandatory, like yes. you have to do yeah. three to five classes yeah. before you can even contemplate coming into reformer. Yeah, totally. And one of the, you know, the big values of Virgin Active, and this is, you know, across many of their companies, is they value curiosity, this this need to want to learn more. And I think that also resembles Joseph Pilates' ethos as well, this need to be okay with practicing and learning, but persistence, perseverance. So once we put a number on something, it limits someone's ability, motivation. If someone can only get to one intro class a week and we're telling them they can only do three or five or three to five before they do a former, they may only do one class a week, five weeks go by, they may not get to a former for like three months. They're not going to develop the skills needed to feel confident into a reformer. We need to have a place where people can start, but then it's their launch pad. Mm. And so launch them into reformer. I love that. And you've mentioned um, there's the global manager, etc. So when when you're looking at Virgin Active, is this a similar setup in the states? Is it a similar setup in the UK? There's the large group reformer settings as mm-hmm. well. So it's I can't give you exact exact numbers, but in um, say South Africa, there's not actually a huge amount of reformer options within their clubs and they have many clubs they have a lot like the South African Virgin Active Pilates team I think is somewhere like 200 instructors wow like it's huge massive Matt Pilates is big it is um probably their their strongest Pilates offering so Reforma and if any listeners are listening in from South Africa, we'd love to hear kind of what your experience with Reformer is. But from what I know, it's not hugely accessible as it is, say, locally here in Sydney, Australia, there's Reformer galore. Right. In the UK, 
it's definitely uh, has a bigger pre- a presence. Yep. But it's still a smaller setting, and which I think speaks to Pilates within the UK. Would you agree with that, Close? Um, I, I must admit, I, I'm not. I don't think I have. I, I, it's hard. Here we go. This is a bit of a raphism. Hard for me to have an opinion on that because I don't think I know enough about it. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, when I think about you know what I've heard of of reformer in the UK. Um, you know, and I think of Aaron from KX, for instance, who, you know, sort of learnt the method. My understanding is he learnt the method when he was living over in UK and by the method I mean that that dynamic mm-hmm. style of, of Pilates, not the method as per referred to often as Joe Pilates, <laughs> um, and brought that back here. So there must have been some large group there. I have, uh, whenever I've had clients who I have initially you know, met in Australia and, and trained them in Australia and then they've gone to the UK either because that's where they're originally from or because they're going to live there. They have slid into my DMs and kind of been like, eh, it's kind of challenging to find reformer mm. like what we were finding really easy to find in in Oz, which is interesting. Whereas I think in the States um, – the, the larger group reformer is starting to gain some momentum. Uh, that's what I hear from the likes of Club Pilates, et cetera. But I think all in all, both of those countries, and again, please, listeners, if you're just going, throwing stuff at the screen going, Chloe, you're not right, well, let me know. <laughs> like, educate me. Um, my understanding is it's kind of sort of not like what we're doing here in Australia. You know, in Australia... <clears throat> the rise of, of group Pilates in what what would we say, Alice, 2000 and like 10 years ago-ish, a bit more, a yeah. bit more, more yeah. than that, 15-ish, 20 years ago. <laughs> you know, I would probably, yeah, Help look, me I would out say here. about 15 years ago there were some purpose-built gyms that really sold a group reformer experience. Yeah. But I would say probably in the last seven or eight years, it, that's almost the way forward. I it, think if a, yeah. someone wants to start up, they, they're kind of looking for, all right, the number I'm gauging is maybe 10. 10 might be the starting point. And, and um, in previous episodes of Pilates Elephants, we've spoken about profitability and you know, you're going to make more money, obviously, with more reformers, and you're going to be able to pay your instructors more money with more mm-hmm. reformers. So, ten's kind of like your bare minimum. If you can get fifteen in there, awesome. You know, um, but again, that's all down to space. But yeah, look, the the rise of the group reformer is is huge in Australia, and I um, I even noticed a difference from when I was teaching in Melbourne, and I felt like there was a group reformer studio basically on every corner it literally felt like that to then when I moved to Sydney and I was like oh this is interesting it's not as prevalent here but then over that five years of being in Sydney reformer studios just kept popping up and group and again when we say group we mean really in those settings it's usually 15-ish um, as a norm yeah. and that mm-hmm. just kept going pop 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 so I'm really interesting to uh, interested to see if that's going to be something that catches on in America and UK, be interesting to see what happens in South Africa. With um, I, that's so interesting for me to hear that Matt Pilates is the popular thing, whereas yeah, like in Australia, you, it's almost I almost feel like you've got to pull someone by their hair, <laughs> kicking and screaming into the Matt Pilates class, and then once they're in there, they're like, oh. Oh my god, this is freaking awesome! I didn't think this would be so hard, and every part of me shaking. And you know, it's like if you can get the people in there, they love it. But it's this hard sell to get them in. Whereas you put up a reformer, it's like, oh, hello, sexy reformer, I'm in. I want to try that. And and with all the bells and whistles, why? Who needs one prop when you could have three? Like, so I think <laughs> when we chat to instructors from you know, and our Virgin Active family is worldwide. We have studios around Asia Pacific. We have it in Thailand and Singapore and in Milan and all throughout the UK and within South Africa. 
And obviously in Australia, we're, we're currently in New South Wales and Victoria, but th- sometimes it's kind of like, all right, what's, what's Australia doing with their Pilates programming? Because in a way we've, we've put a lot of time and a lot of effort in, but we've also really sort of looked at what are the barriers that stop people from doing Pilates? And whether it's Pilates in general, Matt versus Reformer, and I think Virgin Active has put a lot of time into Reforma and I think that's relevant to the Australian market where Reforma Pilates does sometimes have a little, a greater pull, a slight, you know, consumer advantage, so to speak. But I feel like sometimes when we, we look at how do you break down a barrier or a misconception, it's, it's stopping almost this notion of someone needs a f- a certain level to step in to a certain class. Yeah, I love that. So I'd love you to expand on on that. How, you know, what are some of these barriers that you said, you said Virgin Active put a lot of time into exploring that. So so that, that's one example. Someone thinks that they can't go to this class until they're a certain level. What are some other barriers that you've come across? So I think there's um, this kind of sits hand in hand a little bit with some common misconceptions that people associate with Pilates, particularly a gender biased. Uh, yeah. There's still a little bit of a Pilates is only for females. And, and I think one thing that I'm really passionate about, and so is Mark, the global head coach and yoga coach, uh, Pilates coach, oh, a lot of coaches in that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> All the coaches. All the coaches is bringing it back to the roots. We're teaching Pilates and we're using the reformer bed as that vehicle in this instance. And as we know, Joseph Pilates and any of your longtime listeners will appreciate that he was fearless. He had that get up and do it attitude. And it's like, okay, we need to kind of adopt a bit of that. And being fearless doesn't mean being unsafe or not being cautious. We definitely have precautions to make sure people are coming in and we have steps in place to make sure that they're ready, that there's an exception. So when we have, when we found out what were some of the barriers, one was that it's only for women or I don't have X, Y, or Z to attend. I'm not flexible enough. Or I don't have any experience, so I can't. And what was quite interesting was that a lot of people didn't attempt because they couldn't get into an intro class Uh or they found it wasn't convenient for them. Right. And humans are humans. People would come up and they would come to class. And there was one program I didn't mention prior. We have an athletic class, which is, and this may hurt some people's ears, we almost corrupt reformer a little bit. We take reformer moves that people know and love and we marry them with some high-intensity movement patterns. So it is a Pilates party. It is reformer delivered differently. It's music, heart pumping, endorphin, rushing. It's a different ball game. But we had a lot of pushback and a lot of legit concerns about someone new coming into class that didn't really know what they were doing. And we were like, how do we, how do we navigate this? What happens if someone's coming really excited, ready to go? So that was one of the big ways that we had to, we had to address. How do we firstly get people to come? Pilates is for everyone. You don't need any prerequisite. Come in. But when they come, we say, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done that? And they just get deflated. They'll say, oh, uh, no, no, I haven't. And they'll turn away and probably never come back again. So it was like these two catch points. So we get them in and we want to bring them in with a big hug, regardless of their experience. And I'll put that in air quotes because there are some times where you say, maybe this is not the right class for you. But nine times out of ten, absolute beginners can come into an open level reformer class. Mm. Love it, Alice. So um, what do you do? So, okay, I I, I think our listeners would love to 
I'm hearing, uh, 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 I'm doing the talking over myself. Um, so <sighs> tell us your tricks. Like I think that that's <laughs> something, do you know what I mean? I think that that's something that whole, I hear it time and time and time again from instructors and not just new instructors, this thing that constantly comes up, what do I do in a group setting when I have clients of mixed um you know, exposure to Pilates for want of a better word. Maybe someone's got something over here that hurts and someone over here is like this and that. And how do you facilitate, as you said, a big warm hug (laughs) for all of those people in a large group setting so that the instructor, and I hear this as well from instructors, it's like, well, how am I not then going to get my time monopolized? by the mm-hmm. new person over here because I'm, I'm, you know, trying to be mindful that they're not going to fall off the carriage or – so what they, tell me, Absolutely. I feel like you've got – I feel like you've got this little secret thing to to <laughs> offer <laughs> up for us. You're like, mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, so I feel like it, there's two ways to approach it. There's only so much you can control. You can write the best class program, but they, you may not know who's booking into your class, and that can still be the case for smaller – places you might have five beds and know three people but the other two you may not know anything about so they could throw you curveballs so be prepared for curveballs when I program and when I speak to our instructors about programming layer up so let's take give me an exercise close let's do some role playing give me a an exercise that is generally the one that you would not give Oh, okay. no, no, not, not, oh, sorry. I didn't hear the rest of your story. <laughs> I didn't hear the rest of that <laughs> sentence that I would, I, I'm just thinking about something that in a, in a group setting, in an open group setting, mm-hmm. teaser on the long box is something that there will be a varying degree of people who are comfortable, confident with that exercise. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, so say you had a program and in that program, say this is your regular ongoing class and you're coming in week after week or multiple times and it's the same faces, you're, you know, giving people like the winks and the highs and the, hey, how you doing? But then someone comes in and it's like, hey, it's my first time. I've never done Pilates before. Um, okay, cool. And then someone else says, um, I've got a particular X, Y, and Z, which means that I, I don't know if I can do this or that. So when you approach with people that you assume can't do something, you've got to then zone in to them individually and have really quick questions to ascertain what can they do, potentially what they might need to modify. But then that's where we are like, yeah, but you're going to get stuck you're going to get stuck into a a long conversation with them or your class is going to, you know, you've only got five minutes. How do I do that? So you think about the movement patterns that link up, say, with teaser and particularly on the long box. So I would do, say, say I'll do some seated front rowing, right? Cool. We get that happening. Most people are going to be able to sit on a box and reach their arms forward with some degree of load. If they couldn't, say they had some limitation in their arms and they weren't able to, potentially they can just do 30 seconds of reaching their arms forward. I'd say it's a short amount of time. Then see if we can bring that place of experience, maybe not even using the straps, bringing them on the box and maybe going to some body weight abdominal work, getting them comfortable being on that box. If you think, you know what, I'm not going to use the box or I want to introduce this app sequence without the box, keep the box, get them to do it. And you might very subtly, in a respectful way, as they're working, say, through a hundreds variation or something, say maybe hands in strap work, you could say, you know, we're going to be progressing this. Like, hey, Chloe, you're doing so well. How are you going in class? They might be like, yeah, cool. I don't know. So we're going to be doing an exercise. And say they can't do teaser. Say we've, we've got to that fact that teaser is not for them. When we get to teaser, this is what you'll be doing. If someone can't lunge and you're doing, say, a side split, say when we get to lunges, you're going to keep side splitting. Mm, We have to be like a little ninja in that class and be two step ahead. And then you get to the, okay, everyone, get those boxes on. 
say you've set them up, say you've maybe done some front rowing, they've already got their straps in the hand, you get them to get hold the box and slide their hips down and assume maybe the dead hang or maybe you start going to some variations of the movement, be really authentic with them. Today we're going to try teaser. Some of you will nail it, some of you won't. That's not the point though. We're going to try something. Set an expectation that we're going to do a movement And it's going to look a little different. Everyone is going to work through their own capability. And I think that's what we need to celebrate, that it's not going to look identical. And some people will sit up and hit that teaser, what we would call like a textbook teaser. And others might sit up and fold a bit more forward or flick off. Chances are they won't flip off the bed. They might come down with a bit of a thud or sit up a little bit. But if we preface it, if we say this could happen or let them practice the movement and be okay with finding their way, let's celebrate that. Mm, I love that. I think for a lot of, and I know that this was true for me earlier on in my teaching, it was hard. I had this perception, which I think a lot of instructors do, that an exercise should ultimately kind of sort of end up looking a certain way and that that certain way is also what keeps the client, and I, please I'm doing air quotes here, but safe on the reformer and do you know what I mean? It's like if we're looking to the client and the client's doing the herky-jerky movements or the carriage isn't moving smoothly or there's some clanging and banging going on or there is the the thud down and there's sort of the bunny hop up, that that's kind of putting panic stations into the instructor Whereas I think we do need to let go of that. I do, and I've spoken about this with Raf before, and I speak about this with our um, uh, in, those who are learning through us. Is I think there's some things too that as instructors we can mitigate risk of falling. So when I think mm-hmm. about the classic, um, I'm going to use an example here that it, I guess is probably the one that I've seen the most falls in would be kneeling hands in straps facing oh, towards the foot bar, right? Thou shall not say that. That is like, yeah. <laughs> I say, yeah, yeah. That's I'm not going to touch I'm not going to touch wood because that is not evidence based, but um you know, there so I think that there are things where we can facilitate a less risk of falling experience when we do have that mm-hmm. mixed class. But then there's the other things as you said, you know, we're talking looking at the teaser and the teaser looking clunky or the client only getting a, a smidge of the way up or the this or that and that that's so fine and in fact that is part of motor learning and it's an important part of motor learning and um, I'm reflecting on I haven't done a cage lion shout out for a while dear listeners know that that means a push-up Alice um, <laughs> so <laughs> haven't done a cage lion shout out for a while but John Howard Steele recalls and this was in his interview with Raf, recalls being taught by Joseph Pilates, right? So he's there and he's got Joe Pilates next to him. And it's like, well, to try a teaser, he basically just says, okay, you know, just do it. And and that mm-hmm. might, and, and John's like, that literally might not look like you're getting up off that box at all that first time mm-hmm. you try it. Mm-hmm. But the next time you get a bit better and the next time you get a bit better, et cetera. So there is something about that. And I think though, then when we loop that in with motor learning and facilitating early success and clients wanting to actually feel good about their efforts and what they've done and not actually go, oh, I feel like shit because everyone else was, you know, up there in their teaser and I couldn't get off the box. I think that's when it's really important that what you were saying loops in where we are celebrating just the fact that they're there, they're in class, they're trying, they're on the box, whatever they do, is a celebration because mm-hmm. they're there and they're, they're trying. And I think there's not a lot enough of that that goes on. And I think there's the missing link. How do we get people to try being safe? So if we were to zoom in to say that kneeling arm work, for example, you don't have to start kneeling. Like, yes, we as Pilates instructors know that the expression of that is kneeling with a variation of arm movements. Start them seated on their heels. And if someone can't sit in that position for whatever reason, say it's not comfy for their knees, get them to sit cross-legged. If they can't sit cross-legged, get them to sit in, say, that original position where their legs are out front, kind of hanging over the springs. Educate that their arms is really the force that is going to move the carriage. 
and actually Raf, I learned this from Raf a few years ago. He said, get them down, get them moving and explain, press out, hold. As your arms are bending, notice what happens to the carriage. It comes in. So when you bend your arms, go a little bit slower to help you navigate that control. And a really lovely bridging point, and because that exercise is so notorious for falls, is that a lot of the time we are not talking about what's keeping people up. We may say those words that ring true in terms of people expect to hear, engage your core, keep your core on, but that's not actually going to keep someone from falling. People fall with very engaged cores. (laughs) (laughs) Like they're still going to fall. We've seen it time and time again. Mm. And a really nice link that I add is hands on hips, bring your hips up from your heels, lower the hips. Essentially, like doing a kneeling bridge. Okay, now start to add a little T Rex arm just to get the arms moving out a little, in a little. See if you can start to build that up. Cool, get them confident. And if that's not where you want to take it today, stay seated, keep the arms moving. Janet, you're doing great. I know that shoulder is giving a bit of grief today. Just keep the hips. And then you can start bringing people up into that full expression. And this is how we layer it in. I love that. We constantly give permission for people to self-moderate. The only way we can do that though is to give them those little steps to be able to say, if you want to stay just seated with the arms, cool. Mm. If you want to keep playing up and playing up until we get to hold, now hug a tree, cool. Everyone can have that ability to self-moderate and modify. We are there to guide them, encourage them, welcome them. Thanks for sharing that with us, Alice. That's absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. Gosh, what's going on with my what my <laughs> enunciation today? Uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'd love to chat about your postpartum experience. Mm, baby chat. Fab. Welcome back, Al. So we've had a great discussion so far in the podcast about facilitating a, an inclusive warm hug for those trying Pilates and then getting really, you know, getting engaged with Pilates and ultimately finding finding a love for movement, which we hear so much from our clients. Uh, it's like the first thing that I, I heard it just yesterday. I was talking with someone in a shop and she was like, oh, what do you do? And I'm like, did it do? And she's like, oh, Pilates is the first time I've ever found something that I actually love doing. And I was just like, yes, that is something I, I so Me love too. to hear. I love to hear. I know. I think both of you and I can really relate to that. So um, I, I, I love how much you've generously shared um, about how you go about doing that. And I think that's going to be really helpful for um, the listeners. Now I'd really like to segue into the juicy topic, the topic that I feel uh our, our lovely listenership have been eagerly awaiting for. And that's, this is your experience of having, having a bub and going back to teaching and all of those sorts of things. So yeah. um, just share what you would like to share and let's go from there. It's bloody scary. It's the scariest time of your life. And I think for a lot of Pilates instructors, if you don't work, you don't get paid. And you're really reliant on partner's income. You may not even have a partner. Then you're relying on government assistance. So I was scared and I had just started this new role and I was like, Mikkel, I'm pregnant. Like we were both like, oh no. And I remember, and I had my contract, like a proper contract. I'm on a proper salary. I've got a real, like, this is a real role. And I spoke to a friend who's a lawyer and I said, can you please look at this? Like I'm pregnant and I haven't told them, oh my God, is, am I going to get fired? She's like, no, that's against the law. You won't get fired. It's okay. So I sat down with Mark Cito, who's, as I mentioned before, looks after yoga and Pilates globally. And we we're still in the early days of me stepping to this role. So we're having a hundred little little meetings. And I said, Mark, I've got something to tell you. And he's like, yeah, I'm pregnant. Congratulations (laughs) was his response. And I was like, 
so you're not going to fire me? He's like, no, <laughs> uh. no. Once I told Mark I was pregnant, I then called my mother to say she was going to be a grandmother. Wow. So you, you told, you told Mark first. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's where that, I think that's how anxious I was about how will I fit pregnancy in with Pilates. Yeah. And my pregnancy was a dream. I don't really one of those people, but I definitely had a pretty cruisy pregnancy. It could have been the fact that I was in a new role. And during that new role, we set up one of the most beautiful clubs in Sydney, which has four flights of stairs. So I was very active and I had to do a lot of auditions and we were doing lots of Pilates and lots of movement. And I was able to do all the things and I was like, this is great. What a great way to be able to speak uh, uh, with how important exercise is during pregnancy. Like I get it. I get it now. This is awesome. And being able to provide those prenatal options, you know, and I, towards the third trimester, I was definitely like, I was showing Chloe, you saw me like my baby bum was well and truly out. When did, how many weeks were you? I'm trying to remember the last time I saw you was because Anula Mayberg was in Sydney and we were going out to meet her. How many weeks pregnant were you? 37 weeks or something at that 39. point? 39. Oh, 39. 39. So for those playing at home, that's one week off showtime. I remember <laughs> getting some nice little kicks. <laughs> yeah. And I remember just. I was like, I don't think your going. baby likes me. He's really <laughs> kicking me. <laughs> So yeah, I, I worked right up into the day. Wow. Now my pregnancy was a dream. My labor was fucked. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I feel like some of the listeners are probably going, oh, thank God she's human after all. Oh, and my sister-in-law was like, well, you can have a cruisy pregnancy, but pff, yep. Doesn't mean you have a cruisy labor. Right. And here I'm thinking, man, I'm a Pilates instructor. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. I'll be walking in and out. Give me like two hours. I'll be back home <laughs> with my new baby. <laughs> Did not happen. So, but not to put people off, but this was definitely my experience. And I walked in thinking it would all be cruisy, mm. cruisy. And, you know, I got induced Right. Fast forward by 16 hours. So I basically had about six nurses like telling me to calm down and, and push oh and stop thinking about Pilates. I was like, what do you mean? What? Mm. What does that mean? Apparently um, my pelvic floor was too tight. Wow. And mm. literally you were told to stop thinking about Pilates. And my reply was, you keep saying it so I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> like, how do I stop thinking about something you keep telling me to do? And Yeah, it was really, um, I kind of had this flashback to all the pregnant people that I told to really, and this is probably like years ago and I kind of stopped saying it, but I remember saying make sure your pelvic floor is super, super strong but not realising how important it is to, and we're talking pregnancy and pelvic floor, not just in general, but mm. how to relax it, I right. guess, is, is what, um, so when I do speak to pregnant moms that are seeing a, a physiotherapist right. for whatever reason, they are practicing how to release and engage. And uh -huh. it was a very interesting experience. And, and so for you, Al, you not had any touch points with healthcare providers up until then who had explained that to you or who had encouraged you to be able to do that? Say that again. So up until you giving birth, mm. you hadn't had any other healthcare providers no. say to you, hey, no. Mm -hmm. let's talk about also relaxing your pelvic floor, how, how to do that, how does that feel, how can we measure that you're doing that. Right, okay. I didn't. I didn't feel like I needed to. Uh -huh. I felt fine. And, and I still don't think, like I wonder, would, have it, would it have actually made a huge difference? Who knows? Because when you look at the events leading up to it, I was working right up into the day, which yeah. was okay. I didn't have Except time. Except you didn't to, get a break. Didn't get a break. <laughs> Talk about being ripped off. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get a break. I didn't get a, just a moment of, ah. Uh, and I think that was all self-inflicted. 
I felt like I had something to prove because I was new in this role. Right, and yeah. like, it wasn't an external pressure. It was just me trying to be like, I'm pregnant and nothing can stop me. Mm. Okay. So you had beautiful little Savon. Yes. A beautiful, healthy boy and, um, you know, like as newborn life is, you're breastfeeding, you're not sleeping much and, and I thought, how am I ever going to go back to teaching? I, I don't think I can and it wasn't because I necessarily was like I found now a, a drive and pull in motherhood that this is my one and only focus. I was that tired and that exhausted that I thought I just don't know if I could physically do the same hours or the same classes that I used to. Like, how is this ever going to pan out? So tell us more about that journey. What what happened? Like, did you take a certain amount of time off? And then how did you go about re-entering teaching, et cetera? Mm, it's... I feel like this is something that um, a lot of parents, especially if you are, you know, working within the Pilates industry or you may not have an option where you do get maternity leave within your your role. Mm. And because I was new to my role uh, in Australia, maternity leave usually kicks in once you've been employed for a certain amount of time. Uh, so luckily though, the government provides maternity assistance for, I believe it's about 16 weeks. So I had 16 weeks off um, and then coming back in, it's definitely something that you can prepare for, but you don't, don't put excess pressure on yourself. So for me, I used to be teaching very early classes. That's how I used to love to structure my schedule. I would teach, say, 5.45 a.m. or 6.30 a.m. and kind of teach maybe four, maybe even five classes in that mid-morning time, be done by 12. And I couldn't get back to that. No way. I would be like onto my third feed at five in the morning. Right. I used to look at the clock going, <laughs> I used to teach like it's 5.30. I used to be like in the studio yeah. and like save one on my boob and I'm thinking I, this life doesn't seem like how do I get that back? Luckily, you know, Virgin Active was really supportive and I sort of said, you know, I guess I can come back and do sort of two classes. And for me, teaching two classes, it's not a big undertaking, but coming back after having a kid, that was a mammoth. Like I would finish those two classes and be like, wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's done. Yeah. That's and, sorted. and where did he go while you were teaching? So he would either be with my mom or with Miguel so I, there's, you know, I think if you can lean on family and friends to, to help out, we are lucky in, in the fact that we can, you know, earn a decent wage within a, a small-ish amount of hours. Mm. You know, we're not necessarily working a 12-hour shift. Yeah. We, you know, depending on where you are and how you operate, sometimes you can kind of do five classes and that might be enough for your day or starts to get that budget sorted. But I had Miguel and my mom helping me when I would have small classes. I did then put him into daycare and I did have a little bit of guilt around that. I, I, I've five months. I've never met any parent who didn't, ex didn't say they had some guilt around that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. I kind of, you know, I was like, gosh, I wish, you know, I, you kind of think the grass is greener, like, oh, this person took a year off, gosh, they're so lucky, or I think, oh, God, I really didn't plan my life right, why didn't I get pregnant a year later when I could have had like a year of maternity leave? But once he was in daycare and, you know, they just thrive in daycare and I was like, oh, okay, it's all good. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. Baby's back. Mum's back. <laughs> Mum's back. So Mum's back. From a from a um, postpartum return to to exercise, what was yeah. your what was your experience with that? Mm, so, um, when I got assessed three days after delivery, midwives will come to your home and check for 
do all the postpartum checklists. So they will check to see, you know, how you're healing and they'll also check for separation. And what I thought was really funny and kind of not quite sure at 20 weeks, I got checked for any separation. I didn't have any separation. And what and Al's, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, so go. what Al's referring to for those who might be thinking, oh, separation where? Um, <laughs> diastasis recti, so uh, DRAM. Yeah. Yeah. And so we've, didn't have- we've spoken, we had a, there's a great uh, episode oh. uh, of Elephants with um, Anthony Lowe where we, mm. we spoke in quite a lot of detail about it. So, yeah. It's so abdominal separation. Episode. Yeah. Awesome. I okay. highly recommend. So they checked you at, what did you say, 20 weeks? So at 20 weeks, right. um, during my pregnancy, they checked for separation and I didn't have any. Um, and again, I was a bit like, <laughs> I'm so good. So silly. Um, it, it's not about, and that was a really silly mindset to have because as we know, having, experiencing that in pregnancy is very normal. Mm. Oh, um, in fact, the, the last time I looked at the stats, it was almost a hundred percent of, uh, pregnant people have some degree of separation, some, yes. you know, amount of separation yeah. at, at full term. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So sort of halfway through pregnancy, um, it, there wasn't a significant amount for them to be concerned about. Right. And it's just purely like a checklist. Yeah. So you've still got clearance to do all the things you can do. Gotcha. And then I have birth, give birth three days later, the midwife comes and checks again. But what was I found really bizarre was um, she kind of just run, ran her fingertip down my linear alba, so just my midline. I was like, what's she palpating? Because it was so soft. It was like a tender stroke. <laughs> <laughs> what? And she's like, mm, you're okay. <laughs> I was like, okay for what? She's like, you don't have any separation. <laughs> and I said, okay, so does that mean like postpartum exercise? She's like, you're okay. And I was like, all right. I definitely didn't feel okay. Um, I think three post- days postpartum. Yeah, three days postpartum. Wow. Yeah. Um, I'm bloody still exhausted. I still haven't had your day off. <laughs> still, I still haven't, Chloe. Still haven't <laughs> had my day off. Oh, you poor thing. Oh my gosh. Still haven't had that day off. The day that I wanted still hasn't come. But I remember thinking. <laughs> okay, do I, like, can I do the things? Like, can I exercise? Not like I wanted to necessarily, but I think, you know, I kind of got a tick of okay, but didn't feel confident that I, in my opinion, had been thoroughly assessed. And I'm sure I was, but I just was like, hmm, all right. So I didn't really do a lot. And I didn't really pay attention to the postpartum leaflets, which I probably should have. Right. And what, tell me more. What is a postpartum leaflet? Something you... Pelvic floor exercises. Ah, gotcha. But I felt like I had this mental block about pelvic floor, maybe because I was getting screamed at <laughs> during my labor, but not working it. But I just kind of, I just sort of put it in the back of my head, like, oh, I'll be fine. Yeah. I don't have separation. I don't like nothing, you know, so I think I'll be all right. And away I went. But it didn't necessarily have an adverse effect, but I did notice uh, definitely some postpartum pelvic floor dysfunction just a little bit. Um, You know, there was a little bit of incontinence and I feel even saying this out makes me like I feel still the guilt, like still a bit of stigma around that for me. Yeah, that's well. Thank you for sharing that with us, and hopefully that helps um, start to de-stigmatize it. Because I would totally agree that my my clients are always so. It's like oh, I've got I've, I've got to tell you something. I'm like yeah, <laughs> oh, like I'm kind of like wetting myself a bit when I do this. I'm like, hey, let's talk about this. You know, um, it's really interesting, isn't it? That something that is so prevalent and so so mm-hmm. common. Um, and also my, under, my understanding with, with talking to people like um, Sarah Hag and Sandy Hilton, et cetera, who are physios that really work within that realm of pelvic health, 
um, mm-hmm. Anthony Lowe, that it, it's something that you don't have to live with. Like it's something that you can get help for, but it's it's that whole vocalising it, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And even I think vocalising it, but also I think for a lot of women, when you have just had a baby, and I noticed this uh, probably like four months in, so it wasn't like a week later. I was right, like, oh, okay. this came like a little, like I kind of noticed this a little later on. And I think part of me being like, mm, this is something I need to get kind of checked out was avoidance. Right. Oh, I've just like really needed to go to the bathroom and I kind of just, uh, just made it. You know, that's normal, right? Sure. Uh, maybe don't drink too much water before you go and teach your block of three classes because you don't want to uh, get to a point where you're trying to hold your wee and then a little bit comes out. Right. <laughs> and then what happens to active wear when it, you're wearing light pink tights or something yeah. and you need to do a quick wee? Like things like this would play on my head and yep. you know I'm curious to know because it's something we don't talk about like I wonder how many other mums think I better not drink a big glass of water before Pilates yeah better not have my coffee before Pilates no one needs a diuretic when yep. pelvic pelvic health might be slightly compromised yep I have had clients vocalize to me that they are conscious of the active wear they choose to wear just in case I'm definitely one of those like, yep. And I noticed that was my, you know, my postpartum journey started to navigate into, well, this is the new normal. Right. Where before I'd be worried to wear gray pants if I got really sweaty and get like those sweat lines. Now I was like, oh, better not wear gray pants in case, you know, heaven Uh forbid. But I think I remember even I'd say maybe three, four months postpartum, I would have spare tights in my bag, a hundred percent. So what did you, did you, did you seek help? I mean, you said there that you were just kind of being like, yeah, it's, it's or, you know. Mm. I was like, mm. and I think maybe even um, before that at six weeks postpartum, I went to my GP who was also sharing the care of the midwife. So I would alternate midwife to my GP who specialized in, um, pre and postpartum help. And she did an assessment and she got me to do a little ab curl and she palpated. She's like, yes, you're fine. She had a quick internal look and a bit of this and a bit of that. She said, yes, you're fine. So I think for me, I felt like I was fine. I was okay. So when it came to like three to four months where I wasn't, I was like, oh, what's happened? What's happened? I was like, why? (laughs) Why? I almost was like, why is my body betraying me? (laughs) Like, why do I have this problem when it was all good six weeks after giving birth? I was like ready to rock and roll. So yeah, I went back and there is a a physio within my uh, practice that specializes with women's health and postpartum and we did some pelvic floor work and it was actually a very, I only saw her twice, but she gave me a program to help and went, did the program and then saw her, I think maybe five weeks after and it's significantly improved and I continue to do the things that I I need to be doing. Some days I forget, there might be a week go by and I kind of forget. Um, But yeah, I'm due to see her again soon. So it'll be interesting to see what she says. Fantastic. And does she do an internal, I, I mean, I've spoken to quite a few of my clients who have had like an internal um, measurement of the device of tone of the pelvic floor, et cetera. Is that something that? She, um, she did a little bit, but she basically had a, her sort of diagnosis, so to speak, was I was hypertonic. Right. So I had to, it was, she just wanted me to basically practice contract and release fast, quick contraction versus slow release. And, you know, it helped, but I'm glad I saw someone. Um, It helped to the point where I don't suffer that anymore. I think if it didn't work, I'd definitely be like, you know, I'm in an area where I can see 
all the physios that you kind of mentioned, Anthony Lowe would be the person I would be going to if it progressed any worse. So, so with the, the contraction and release, and I, I'm just mindful I'm now looking at time we're probably coming somewhat so what what a, what a great what a great thing to to end on it's a bit of <laughs> like with the because the, I mean what does that mean contract and release like how mm. how would you describe that to someone or how do you practice that I think that's a worthwhile so for me um for me to practice that I actually find in a seated position uh-huh. is where it is best for me to f- be somewhat more attuned to it. Um, what's interesting, the postpartum leaflet that I got straight out of hospital encourages you to do pelvic floor exercises in various positions, seated, laying down, standing, advice that I clearly ignored. But for me, yeah, I'll just, I'll just do it when I'm seated. I feel like I can kind of get a bit of connection there, so to speak. I'll try it when I'm standing. Your and face looks well, so I'm, confused. I'm looking at you. I'm like, okay, so the last – well, I do. I am sitting here looking confused. Mother of cats here, but um. – <laughs> mother, mother of dragons. Okay, mother so the, of little kitty cat. So the last time I was ever cued through some pelvic floor stuff was many moons ago. I'm talking before I was a Pilates instructor, after I'd hurt my back. You know, it was back in the day where it's kind of like you got a sore back you better work on your core Mm. muscles, your your pelvic floor being one of those. And therefore you've got to learn to contract your pelvic floor. Basically that was the narrative. And I remember being sat on a fit ball, like a big fit ball. Yes. Yeah. And being kind of like, it was in this um, small group setting and I was put in the corner and Al, you you know me well enough. You must, uh, you can imagine I was just like, what the actual fuck is this? I was put in the corner and basically told to think about, you know, (laughs) I'm like, uh-huh. what do you want me to, like, I, what, what do you want me to do here? I'm just sitting here rolling on this ball. I, I don't know. So when you look at me and you okay. go, okay, well, yeah, I just want you to sit on the chair and do what? All right. So get ready. <laughs> yeah, this, I'm ready. This episode's going down. <laughs> so here's sort of like one of my little drills, okay. so to speak. Yeah. And for me, it's a bit like replicating that sensation of a fit ball. So you can feel okay. something against you. So I would sit and open those legs and lean forward. Right. Right. So I've got something I can kind of connect to, but what I would do is, and this was the analogy that my physio had told me was think of a big, like bubble tea straw, like a big straw. Yeah. Imagine it there. And you're sucking up a thick shake, like a really thick chunky milkshake like I was like all right okay I was looking at her the way you're looking at me no I feel like I'm looking at you with more understanding now I'm like this is something I can get around okay so so (laughs) just telling me to sit on a chair doesn't the premise and when you're sucking that thick shake you're imagining that it's going to be spurting kind of sort of in the direction towards your belly button not your back ah I think I'm so doing then, it. Okay, cool. So maybe we can play along. So it would be. Yeah, dear listeners, I hope everyone's just, uh, everyone, if, you, if you, you've if you come this far, you haven't, as Jenna said, you haven't come this far to only come this far. So. <laughs> <laughs> just, does that sound just really dirty with this current topic? Any who's. Shout out Jenna Sabino, we love you. <laughs> so the way she would kind of talk me through it and she's like, look, just, you know, at one point, um, my sort of symptoms had diminished. So she's like, this is kind of like maintenance. Do it kind of when you remember, like it's sort of like a, okay, you got your straw ready. Yeah. Everyone, we're about to suck that thick shake up. And she'd be like, so when she clicks and says the number, you suck up. So she's like, ready? You go contract on 10, 9, 8, follow my tempo, 6, 5, Four, three, two. Now we're gonna go faster. Contract and release. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Have a little kind of chill. Then you do ten slower. Contract and hold. Three, two, release. 
contract and hold. I can't believe I'm just doing this to you right now, Chloe. Really great. This is fantastic. This is helpful. Yeah. So, and, and that kind of hurt, and, like, and helps. it's like this taboo thing. It's like, we can't talk about, do I think we should be queuing this in a group setting? No, no. And that Please was, no. Really, and yeah, like no. The, we're not advocating taking this back to the, no, <laughs> the no. 25 reformer group setting. Mm-mm, this mm-mm, is, mm-mm. this is for, this is great advice for our, our, our prenatal, our postpartum, uh, yep. just our clients. I mean, and you don't have to have been prenatal or postpartum to be affected by pelvic floor issues, Absolutely, yeah. whether that be a weakness or as in your case, um, mm. hypertonic where you're having, uh, which means you're having trouble re- relaxing basically the muscle. Yeah. Um, that, that was also awesome. postpartum being intimate with your partner is a really scary thing. And I think there's a lot of women that tense up, you know, there's this thing about, Oh, there's Mm. still a lot of stigma around what will sex be like after having a vaginal birth. And if you're having painful sex or you're not enjoying it, that's something to not ignore either. Go get it checked out if you feel, you know, your postpartum journey is taking a few turns because mine did a little bit. Thank you so much for sharing that, um, Alice. I I really hope that by you sharing that on on this so generously on a public platform like this that it might um, help some listeners feel like they can actually talk up about it and go and go and seek some help if that's if mm. that's what they need um for me it was really interesting hearing you say that it, it came around the the four month mark postpartum um I think in in my head I would would have thought it was kind of like part and parcel of straight away in the postpartum mm. period so that's mm. been um quite an eye-opener for me and I now feel confident that I know how to do a pelvic floor contraction so <laughs> Thank you for leading us through that. (laughs) Thank you for leading us through that. Um, Alice, it's been freaking awesome. So we've, you know, we've, what a, what a great discussion. Um, Thank you for being just so candid and so awesome. Oh, thanks, Chloe. Thank you for inviting me on this amazing platform. I just think it's doing absolute wonders for our industry and supporting everybody that, teaches and enjoys and does all the things that Pilates does. It's amazing. Thanks, Alice. See you soon. Bye for now, Chloe.